Hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a brief history of tea and we'll be making specific reference to the culture of drinking tea and how uh, in the UK and how tea actually got uh, to the UK in the first place. So um, tea is definitely one of the most popular beverages uh, across the planet and uh, be it to overcome an illness or to boost one's energy Lots of people can't possibly imagine starting the day without uh, a cup of tea. But somehow, whenever the word tea is uh, brought up, we associate it uh, with the UK. And um, even though it is not grown in this country, it forms an essential part of uh, British culture. Uh, the history of tea is a very turbulent one. Lots of nations competed to, uh, to bring it to the UK to start selling tea. Um, but um, originally, it was uh, a luxurious product and uh, only the affluent people could afford it. <clears throat> but it is very so fascinating, all the more so, because it's hard to tell who should be credited with its uh, discovery and uh, even more so how it's reached and spread across different cultures and continents and how it acquired new taste. So let's have a look. There are at least two legends, so I've picked two, um, these two, uh, which tell about the origin of tea. So according to one, it was um, a Chinese emperor, Sheng Nun, who discovered tea, um, known as the Divine Farmer, somewhere between the 20, 2852 and 2070 BC. Uh, it is believes that he was uh, boiling his water, as usual, when a leaf from a nearby shrub fell into his spot. Because he was a known herbalist, he had tasted the brew, and of course that's how tea was born. Um, tea is allegedly one of his greatest discoveries. On the other hand, there's a story of Indian Prince Bodhidharma, who lived somewhere between the 5th and the 6th century, um, and uh, he was a Buddhist monk uh, who converted to Buddhism and in the 6th century went to China to spread the word. Uh, he believed that it was necessary to stay awake uh, constantly for meditation and prayer. To do so, he fell into the habit of chewing um, leaves from the tea shrub and they acted as a stimulant and as a result kept him awake. According to another legend, uh, which is a bit more gruesome and shocking. Um, he cut off his eyelids while meditating, so they would never close again. And uh, it is according to this legend that uh, the place where these where his eyelids fell um, gave birth to uh, tea, tea, uh, tea bushes, uh, which sprouted from the ground from the place where they had landed. Um, but um, before it reached uh, British shores and settled there for good, tea underwent a very interesting journey. So let's have a look at tea's evolutionary journey. So it is definitely believed to be discovered sometime between the 30th century BC and the 21st century BC. Um, and um, it was uh, initially used as um, medicine in ancient China and people chewed on fresh leaves because they found it very refreshing and believe that it has a very invigorating effect. Uh, it was later on that they started brewing tea and making um, a drink out of it. Uh, so by the end of the 3rd century, um, tea had become China's number one beverage. And by the 8th century, um, Chinese were already trading tea with Tibet, with uh, the Arabs, with the uh, Turks, and with um, the nom nomadic tribes of the Indian Himalayas. Uh, of course, they also traded uh, tea into India along the Silk Road. But it was during the Ming Dynasty that the concept of roasted tea leaves somehow came into being. And it was later during the Ming Dynasty that the, the whole tea drinking ceremony has uh, changed and some innovations were added. Um, they introduced new tea varieties, um, the prevalence of loose tea was developed and they paid a lot of attention to how tea was served and how tea was drunk. But it wasn't until the 16th century that tea reached European soils. 
and it wasn't it was only in the 17th century that the British were introduced to tea. Um, how did tea arrive in Europe? So as many wrongly assume it was the British who brought and popularized tea in Europe, um, it is someone else who should be credited with the introduction of tea to the old continent. Uh, even though it was the Portuguese merchants and uh, priests who made first contact with tea, tea was first introduced to Europe in, um, by an Italian traveler who, in 1555, in uh, his voyages and travels, um, mentioned tea for the first time. So he made uh, the first European reference to tea, which were actually based on his second on, um, on second-hand reports. But definitely, it was the Portuguese priests and merchants who made their first contact with tea, and uh, they um, sometime around the 16th century, at which time it was termed cha. So the first Portuguese ships reached China somewhere around 1516, and in uh, 1560, Portuguese missionary um, published the first Portuguese account of China, uh, Chinese tea. But although some of these individuals, Portuguese of course, may have brought back samples of tea to their native countries, it was not the Portuguese who were the first to ship back tea as a commercial input. This was done by Dutch, uh, namely by Dutch East India Company. Um, the company established its trading post on the island of Java and it was by this island that the company sent their first consignment of tea uh, from China to Holland. So by the turn of the century, tea became a fashionable drink among the Dutch. And uh, from there it spread to um, other countries in continental Europe, uh, mainly in the Western part. Uh, but because of its high prices and the fact, uh, because of its uh, high prices and um, which were the result of high taxes, it remained a drink for the wealthy. So um, from the 1600s uh, to the end of the 1700s, tea was considered Dutch. Um, so its first recorded cargo input, import was in 1606, and the earliest reference in Britain was um, not before 1658. And it was thanks to a Portuguese princess, Catherine of Braganza, that the tea was introduced to England. So let's have a look. Um, two ladies are credited with uh, the introduction of tea and the development of uh, the event called afternoon tea. So when Charles II ascended the throne, uh, he inherited lots of debts and incurred some of his own. So because he was in uh, desperate need of cash, uh, he one of the solutions was to marry a foreign princess and the choice fell on Catherine of Braganza. Of course, he... Uh, demanded a substantial dowry, which he got. Uh, so Portugal's Catherine of Braganza had a large dowry, which include um, money, spices, treasure, and two lucrative ports of Tangiers and Bombay. Um, among the personal things she brought to the UK was a chest of tea, which was uh, her favorite drink. Um, and uh, tea was very popular among Portuguese aristocracy. So it was um, it was actually in England that Catherine became something of a trendsetter. So when she arrived there, tea was only consumed uh, as for medicinal purposes, for medical purposes. So uh, since the young queen was used to sipping tea uh, as her daily routine, she continued her habit um, on English court and it became a very popular social beverage. So her regular drinking of tea encouraged others to drink it. Ladies basically flocked to copy her and be part of her circle. Her love of tea became fad at the royal court. And um, soon it spread to aristocratic circles and eventually it was eagerly adopted by wealthier classes who could afford it. But um, it was... Uh, even though the introduction of tea in England is credited to the Portuguese princess Catherine of Braganza, the afternoon tea started with Anna, the 17 Duchess of Bedford, somewhere around 1840. Now, afternoon tea probably has its roots in uh, the ladies' parties of the 17th century, 
but it definitely evolved uh, during the 18th century and it became somewhat of a national um, institution, an elaborate social occasion. Um, Anna started drinking tea and having a bite to eat somewhere in the mid-afternoon. Uh, the reason was because she wanted to satiate her hunger because the gap between lunch and dinner was huge. Um, lunch was usually eaten at about one o'clock and dinner at around seven o'clock. Uh, this quickly developed into a social occasion and uh, Duchess was soon inviting guests to join her for afternoon tea at five o'clock. So by uh, the 1860s, the fashion of afternoon tea has become so uh, widespread. Um, it was a very ceremonious, very elegant affair and uh, tea was drunk from very delicate uh, china, from the best china uh, there was and accompanied of course by uh, small amounts of food which included bread and butter, uh, scones and uh, sandwiches with crusts cut off. Um, but um, the roots of afternoon tea, of course, uh, may be uh, traced back to London's uh, coffee houses. Now, uh, coffee houses in the 17th century were the centre of social life. Um, this is where wealthy men uh, gathered to do business and discuss the events of the day. Every respectable Londoner had uh, his own favourite coffee house. So Tories and Whigs had their favourite ones, so did poets, critics and members of clergy. Uh, coffee houses filled the place that was later occupied by the club, but they were of course a lot more cheaper and um, they, they were a lot um, less formal. Uh, so in days before telegram and uh, effective journalism, news could be more easily obtained at the coffee houses. Uh, at the time, uh, tea was subject to taxation and it was still a very uh, expensive commodity. So between 1660s and 1689, uh, tea was sold in coffee houses and it was taxed in liquid form. So the whole day's tea would be brewed in the morning and it would be taxed by an excise officer. Uh, it was then capped in barrels and reheated as needed during the day. So if a visitor came late in the afternoon to have a cup of tea, he would be drinking tea, he would be drinking tea that was made early in the morning. The quality of tea, of course, improved after 1689, when the system of taxation underwent some change. So it was altered and the tea was uh, taxed by the leaf rather than by liquid. Um, so uh, tea parties of the 18th century owe their origin to ladies' parties organized in the 17th uh, century. Namely, some of the coffee houses um, also sold tea in loose form so that it could be brewed at home, which meant that it could also be enjoyed by women who didn't frequent coffee houses. Um, because it was a relatively expensive thing um, and tea drinking in the home must have been largely restricted to wealthier households where women would gather to have their little parties. Uh, green and um, black teas were popular alike some uh, added sugar to tea, which was also an expensive input because it was also subject to uh, a tax. And in the 17th century, it was still unusual for milk to be added to, to the beverage. So while 17th century men uh, gathered at the coffee houses to exchange gossip, their wives gathered at each other's homes to do the exactly the same thing, but in a more refined atmosphere. But it was actually an East India Company that was crucial to the history of tea trade. In 1600, a group of English businessmen asked Elizabeth I for a royal charter that would allow them to, to travel to the East Indies on behalf of the Crown in exchange for a monopoly on trade. Uh, the mer merchants uh, put up nearly 17,000 pounds of their own money to finance the whole venture and the East India Company was born. So the company was given a monopoly over all British trade, which included tea. Soon the company began competing with uh, the Portuguese and when Charles II uh, was restored to the throne in 1660, he extended the company's privileges, which was then allowed to take military action 
to establish itself in places where it wished to trade. By the beginning of the 19th century, with the help of the British Army, the company had conquered about half of India. Uh, the company enjoyed absolute monopoly over tea input and imposed high taxes on it. And this led to an enormous amount of tea being smuggled and sold illicitly. Some of it was even brought in on the East, Indian, in East India's own ships and sold by crew members to smugglers. Uh, and it was... Um, until, it was not until the William Pitt the Younger became the Prime Minister that the situation um, changed. Um, in 1783, he passed the Communication Act, of seven, uh, passed the Communication Act, which was adopted in 1784, and he slashed the tax on tea so dramatically uh, that it made uh, smuggling pointless. Uh, so basically, because this meant that the company uh, was no longer allowed to impose high taxes on tea. Uh, as a result, the company ran into financial problems. So, because illegal tea smuggling was uh, vastly reducing the amount of tea being bought from the company, it uh, came up with an idea. Its profits plummeted, its top pile of unsold tea increased, and in an attempt to, re to somehow try and revive its dwindling business and avoid bankruptcy, it, the company asked the British um, government for permission to export tea directly to America. Uh, this was a move that would enable it to get rid of a surplus stock, uh, tea, stock of tea. Um, so in 1773, the Tea Act was passed, which allowed a certain duty to be levied on the export to America. Many Americans objected to being taxed by a parliament which did not represent them. But regardless of this opposition, the East India Company continued with its plans, and in 1773, four ships, Dartmouth, uh, Eleanor, Beaver and William, set sail for Boston carrying tea. So in the weeks that these ships were sailing, uh, the American opposition grew more and more resolute in their decision not to not allow the British to impose any kind of tax uh, on, on Americans. So when Dartmouth reached America on the 28th of November, 1773, um, the locals didn't allow the tea to be brought ashore and wouldn't uh, pay the tax either. Despite the attempts to resolve the matter, both sides remained locked in a stalemate. In a stalemate. So, in the early evening of the 16th of December, a group of men, some of which were disguised as Native American Indians, boarded the ships, uh, the ships threw all the tea, namely 342 chests, into the sea. No one got hurt, nothing was destroyed, but the following morning, large quantities of tea could be seen floating in the harbour waters. In retaliation, the British government passed five laws in early 1774 that became known as the Intolerable Acts. Uh, although they were intended primarily to punish the people of Massachusetts, um, the acts include closing the port of Boston until the tea was paid for, restricting town meetings and giving the British a point of government more power, they played a key role uh, in uniting the 13 American colonies against British rule. So in September of 1774, representatives of the colonies met at the First Continental Congress to plan common measures of resistance against the Act. This led to the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence, which was signed in July 1776. That was only three years after the Boston Tea Party. Uh, when America eventually won its independence from British rule in 1783, it began its own free, independent trade, uh, a tea trade with China. Um, so let's have another uh, uh, look at another very important um, activity, tea, uh, tea auction. So it is worth mentioning that London tea auctions were a grand tradition that lasted for 300 years the first auction took place in 1679 and the last one in 1998. Uh, it was a regular event that made London the centre of the international tea trade. Uh, 
As Britain stood to neutering, the auctions became a weekly affair. Uh, even after Britain's tree producing colonies won their independence, the weekly London auctions remained a focal point for the global industry. And as late as the early 1970s, some 50% of the world's tea was traded in London. The first auctions, of course, was held by the East India Company, which at the time held a uh, monopoly for input uh, uh, of tea and other goods from China and India. Uh, they were held at the company's uh, headquarters. However, things changed in 1834, when the East India Company became merely a managing agency for the British government in India. In uh, 1858, the company, um, the British government took over control of India from the East India uh, Company. And in 1873, the company ceased to exist as a legal entity. So after so many years, tea became a free trade commodity. And by 1888, British tea inputs from India were for the first time greater than those from China. Um, to illustrate how tea consumption skyrocketed in around uh, 50 years, whereas in 1851, virtually all tea in Britain had come from China, and, any, and annual consumption per head was less than half uh, a litre, it was in 1901, due to cheaper inputs from India and Sri Lanka, then called Ceylon, another British colony, that consumption rocketed to over 2.8 million milliliters sorry, per head. Um, as we have seen, tea had become firmly established as part of the British way of, way of life. And so during the First and the Second World War, when the government bought all tea on the market in 1942, the government took control um, of the importation of tea to Britain in order to ensure that this beverage was available at an affordable price. Tea was definitely an object of comfort. Of, an object of comfort. It was um, the nation's uh, favorite pick-me-up, and uh, it was very easy to make, and it was healthy, and. In terms of the war, it reminded soldiers of their home. However, unfortunately, during the 1940s and 1952, um, tea had to be rationed. Tea prices began to rise as a result of ships being sunk by German submarines. So the Ministry of Food introduced a ration of around 60 milliliters of tea uh, per person per week. This was enough for around two to three cups of uh, rather weak tea a day. So um, when in 1952, the Minister uh, of Food announced that they would be lifting tea rationing, there was probably no happier nation in the whole world. Now, let's have a look at some fun facts. Um, if one can afford it, afternoon tea, a light meal typically taken between 3.30 and p.m. and 5 p.m., this is when tea is actually usually drunk. But lots of people prefer to have tea in the morning, in the afternoon, and in, in the evening, simply whenever they like. The percentage of people who drink tea, well, it is believed that the British population, that 80% of the British population um, drink tea. And um, in terms of how many cups they drink a day and a year, uh, approximately 100 million cups uh, are, are drunk daily, which is almost 36 million per year. Younger consumers are generally twice as likely to consume specialty teas than older consumers, with uh, black tea being the most popular type of tea drunk by uh, the 25 to 35 year old groups. Why do British put milk in tea? And uh, who put milk first? So, um, the answer is that in the 17th and 18th century, uh, the China cup tea was served in was so delicate that they would crack from the heat of the tea. So um, milk was added to cool the liquid and stop the cups from cracking. Um, and that is why today many English people add milk to their cups before uh, serving and drinking tea. I hope you liked it. I'll see you some other time.